Hello class. Uh, today we're going to look at Mao's Communist China. So you should be able to describe China under Mao's rule and evaluate Mao's legacy by the end of this lesson. Um, as we talked about in our last lesson, um, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party and the war hero that comes out of the Chinese Civil War is Mao Zedong. Now, Mao Zedong it can be pronounced Zedong or Zetong um, because, you know, non-Chinese speakers tend to not pronounce Chinese very well. And I am not a Chinese speaker, so um, I'm doing the best I can. But it's also spelt more than one way because of the transliteration. You're trying to take Chinese characters that represent sounds that are not native to European languages and approximate them with Roman letters. And so there are different ways to try and do that. And we've been over this before when we were talking about um, Emperor Qing, for example. Okay, um, a quick reminder that if you want to refer to Mao Zedong by one name, it's Mao, right? Because um, in, in China, the family name comes first. So if your name is John Smith, it would be Smith John in China, right? Because the family name is more important than your given name, your first name. Um, so don't call Mao Zedong Zedong. That, you're, that would be like calling um, Trump Donald. You're not buddies. You don't know this person. So you call them by their last name. Um, that's always the case with world leaders, um, except for monarchs. So that's why we call Napoleon Napoleon when his name was actually Napoleon Bonaparte, because he was the emperor, um, the monarch of the French Empire. Um, same thing with like King Henry, whatnot. It's it's kind of different because the monarchs own the country, and so they're kind of identified as being with the country. So the last name of the dynasty is kind of like a it's like a given. It it's a weird difference, but it it. It, that's the way it goes. So anyway, bottom line, you refer to him as Mao, um, not as Zedong, okay? So uh, first, we're going to look at um, how China compares to Russia, because this is our second major country to start to try and create a communist society, right? Um, so if we're looking at China and Russia at this time, um, how industrialized was Russia when it became communist? Yeah, not very industrialized, mostly agrarian. And um, would Marx have been expecting a communist rebellion in Russia? No, because he was thinking of communism taking place in heavily industrialized societies like Germany or England. So when it happens in Russia, it requires all these changes, right? That's where we get Leninism from. And then Stalin kind of goes off and, and even adjusts Leninism and it becomes Stalinism. And they do a whole bunch of things that Marx would hate and it doesn't look anything like communism is supposed to look. Well, China is even less industrialized than Russia was in 1917 when Russia had its revolution. So, um, like, in China, we talked about during the Civil War, who was the Communist Party's major base of power? It was the peasants. In Russia, that was not the case. The peasant farmers were not the communist base of power. Um, Lenin's major base of power were like some students and some industrial workers in the cities, and they were his vanguard, um, and they were going to like bring the rest of the country in line. For Mao, this is very different. It's the peasant farmers, and that's going to be a very important to the unique brand of communism that's going to pop up in China. Um, so keep that in mind, right? Ch Mao's major power base is the peasant farmers. Okay, now. Um, prior to communist rule in China, 70% of the land in China is owned by only 10% of the people. So these are numbers that should remind you um, a lot of, you know, our French Revolution numbers, um, a lot even of how uh, Russia looked. Okay, so. Um, the first major priority for Mao coming to power, given what his power base is and this massive amount of inequality, 70% of the land owned by 10% of the people, is going to be land redistribution, right? Um, he has promised this to the peasants as they're supporting him through the Civil War. So um, when Mao comes to power and the nationalists lose and they flee, where do they go? They go to Taiwan, the Republic of China, right? as opposed to our People's Republic of China in mainland China. Again, that's from the last lesson. Mao seizes the land, right? And he doles it out to the peasants. Now, again, remember when the Chinese communists had been fighting the war with the nationalists against, not Japan, but against the warlords, um, they, this is what they had been doing. When they seized 
territory from the warlords that had given it out to the peasants. So they're basically doing the same thing again, but now on a much bigger scale because now they control the whole country. Obviously, not everybody is going to be happy about this, particularly the people who owned the land, right? The landlords. So communist forces kill more than a million landlords, physically dragging them out of their homes, putting them up in front of massive like peasant mobs, having the peasants spit on them, hurl insults and grievances about the bad way the landlords had treated the peasants. And to be fair, you know, the landlords, you might have had a nice landlord, just like in feudalism um, in China or in Europe, you might have had a good noble. And we saw peasants um, back in the French Revolution counter protests, uh, some of them were upset that they lost their nobles, their landlords. Um, so you might have had a good landlord, but a lot of landlords were very um, exploitative of the peasants and they weren't very nice um, bosses. Um, so there's a lot of insults and, and grievances to be aired here. So, and then um, people often demand that their landlords be executed. And so the party does it, right? Because they're, they wanna make the peasants happy. And again, they have no love for these kind of petty bourgeoisie uh, landlords. So um, initially, peasants own their newly acquired land. So it gets doled out to the peasants and they're farming their own little plots of land, right? So we've redistributed the land. But it doesn't stay that way for very long. Um, before we get to that, actually, I should pause and say, okay, so we've redistributed the land. Would Marx be okay with it at this point? They own their newly acquired land and they own what they make. Yeah, this is, this is, this is what Marx would want. Um, again, he wouldn't want it in a massively agricultural society, but if this is what we're doing, the idea that the peasants control their own livelihoods, that is, um, that is Marx's aim, that they control the means of production, so they own what they make, right? Okay, would he have been happy with the murdering of a million landlords? Does Marx think that a violent revolution has to be the way you go? No, because again, it should be enough that you take away the territory or whatever means of production your bourgeoisie owns and give it to the proletariat, in this case, the peasants. And by doing so now, the landlords are no longer the bourgeoisie anymore. They're also the proletariat, right? Because they don't own the means of production anymore, right? So this, the murdering of a million people, that's not in line with Marxist thought. Okay, so anyway, the peasants own their newly acquired land. But as I said, it doesn't stay that way for long. So we see Mao force the peasants to join collective farms or communes. So he's putting together all these smaller farms that he had initially doled out. Now he's recollectivizing them, making them big plots of land. And two to 300 families are going to work on huge farms, um, which will be owned by the state. Is this a Marxist idea? No. Have we seen this somewhere before, though? Yeah, this should be reminding you of what Russia did, right? And the collectivization, the nationalization of the agricultural industry um, under Stalin, right? Okay, at this point, um, lots of other things are changing too, not just who owns the land. So, like, family life is going to be disrupted. The, the kids are going to be raised by, like, the village now. So it's not like you've got all these families kind of concentrated on these big plots of land. Um, and kids are going to be kind of shared amongst the families and raised together and like, you know, basically you're going to bathe like 20 kids at a time and feed them all at the same time. Um, this is not traditional family life. This is the idea that, hey, we're all pitching in. It's hard to raise a child. It is. It takes a lot of care and a lot of work. And it definitely helps if you have an extended family, you know, aunts, uncles, grandparents. Um, but this goes way beyond that. And so now the idea is like, you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child. Children learn from everybody around them. So now everybody's going to pitch in and try and help each other out. Um, but of course, by doing like state approved things. Um, there's also going to be like a massive public health campaign. So we're at this point, the Chinese communists are trying to fundamentally remake Chinese society. Right? Um, <clears throat> there's going to be massive propaganda campaigns. Mao loves film and propaganda films. So you're going to see public service announcements about hygiene and cleanliness and how important it is to keep the streets clean and sweep up. And everybody needs to do their part. So even if you didn't drop the piece of litter, you should pick it up if you see it. Um, you're going to see like little young girls who are like 10 years old yelling at old men who are spitting on the sidewalk, right? About how unsanitary that is. Now that's a big deal. Why would the fact that you've got propaganda films where you're encouraging young children, in, including girls, to yell at old men in China be such a big deal? 
Well, this is completely flipping the power structure that we're used to. First of all, gender dynamics, right? Women are supposed to be subservient to men throughout most of Chinese history. We've talked about a few notable exceptions, um, women who bucked the norm. But um, for the most part, by and large, women are supposed to be subservient to men, especially according to Chinese, or, um, Confucian thought. And of course, the elderly are supposed to be respected and they're supposed to be the ones that are um, setting the rules, not the young people yelling at old people. So we're seeing a change in culture here, um, not just uh, the idea of like also public health and the fact that communists are supposed to take care of all the people and keep them healthy and provide health care and all that. Um, this is also, you're going to see massive campaigns about like getting rid of pests, so killing locusts and cockroaches. And um, also there's a massive campaign about killing sparrows because sparrows were considered to be a real nuisance and they would eat some of the crops. So there's this massive campaign that like, if you want to be a true Chinese patriot and good communist comrade, go out and kill lots of sparrows. And so like the peasants flock to the field, shooting them down with slingshots and beating them with rakes and whatever you can get them with. Um, so this is going to be a problem because it's hugely successful. But for those of you who have studied like ecology and the food chain in biology class, if you kill all the birds, what's going to happen? Yeah, there's nobody around to eat all the bugs. So then they're going to see massive crop failures because of like swarms of locusts that show up and, and eat the bugs. Or I'm sorry, eat the crops because there's nothing there to eat the bugs. So... What you're seeing here is massive pitching campaigns, people working together, and that can be a great thing, but it's not always super really well thought out about like cause and effect. So for example, killing the birds. Right? Okay, um, now this is all, we're talking like agricultural farm life right? in uh, rural societies, because most of China is a rural. So China is going to try and industrialize Starting in 1953, you're going to see Mao implement a five-year plan. Where have we seen a five-year plan before? What does it do? Right? It's modeled on the Soviet-era five-year plan, right? Or the Soviet five-year plans during Stalin's reign, which sets really high production goals, right? For coal, steel, cement, electricity, building new factories, right? You're trying to see factories pop up. I mean, China had, had a few industrialized cities, but very, I mean, very few, very few. It's mostly, by and large, I mean, again... Um, even less industrialized than the Soviet Union had been, and they really only had a handful of industrialized cities. Because again, the um, European powers had been interested, had seen their national interest tied to keeping China from industrializing. So China would be reliant on industrialized goods from outside, they'd have to buy, and then they would produce the traditional goods like porcelain and silk that the European new middle class and upper class were looking for. Okay, um, in the Soviet Union, did the five-year plans successfully increase the level of industrialization in the Soviet Union? Yes, they did. Were the production goals always reached? No, because they were set really, really high. But they did promote more industrialization. If you set a production goal at 200% and people um, only hit, you know, an additional 100%, well, that's still a massive, like, jump if you started out at, like, 50% of where you wanted to be. So... In China, you see similar success. Again, a lot of times the goals aren't actually reached, but they are pro creating um, production goals that push people beyond what they had been producing before. Very aspirational goals. Um, so after the first five-year plan, you know, China is more industrialized, but still has a long, long way to go if we're looking at what Mao actually wanted. So if this were like the Soviet Union, what would you expect next? another five-year plan, just like Stalin did. Um, but Mao kind of takes a breath and says, well, is that worth it? Is industrialization necessary? Is this something we should really be focusing our efforts on? Um, normally, I would have a discussion here with you about whether or not industrialization is necessary. Um, but we're, we're just going to move on and say that, well, from both Marx and Lenin thought so, right? And, and you know, Stalin is pushing for industrialization. But Mao begs to differ. Um, he says, hey, you can make a communist state with peasants as peasants. You don't need to make more industrial workers. And in fact, he is not particularly interested in industrializing for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, China doesn't have as much of a need to industrialize for self-defense purposes. Um, 
England and, and Germany are not clear threats right now because they've just tired themselves out from World War II. Um, the United States is pretty busy and it doesn't look like it's poised to invade. Japan has been crushed and its military has basically been wiped out. Um, so it's not really a threat anymore. The Soviet Union itself only has a couple of industrial like factories over here. Most of their industrialization capacity is in the West, um, which makes sense for defensive purposes against the industrialized Europe. So they're not a massive threat in terms of invasion. You know, Russia, or sorry, the Soviet Union, they do have strategic concerns about, you know, if Germany were to regroup and invade or the United States and, and um, its allies like Britain and France. But, you know, China doesn't face those those threats. And it also has those natural um, defensive barriers of like the desert and the Himalayan mountains. Um, it will later pursue nuclear weaponry, but um, industrial weapons, you know, it's not, it doesn't hurt to have them, but Mao feels like what they've got is probably sufficient. Um, kind of seeing like almost a repeat of what uh, we saw when the Europeans first showed up and China was like, nah, we don't need to industrialize. Um, we still see that strain of thought, but here for different reasons, not just out of tradition, but because the peasants are Mao's major base of support. And so he doesn't want to turn them into factory workers and he feels like it's unnecessary. Um, there's additionally the fact that Mao doesn't like the idea of creating a division between the countryside and urban industrial centers. Um, he wants China to be kind of uniform throughout. And so, um, so China, under Mao's leadership, is going to take a very different approach, which is very peasant focused. Keeping the peasants as peasants um, with what he calls the Great Leap Forward. So this is an attempt to create industrial products um, by having the peasants make them. So he's going to do a couple different things. He's going to create even more massive collectivized farms. Not just 200 to 300 families now, which were already really big, but now we're looking at 15,000 acre farms worked on by over 25,000 people each. Right. That, those, that's the size of like a town that now its entire town is this is, is running these farms. Um, this is going to create problems because, again, you do have a lot of buy in amongst the peasants and they are trying. Um, but it is it's one thing to work together as a group when you know each other. Like we've looked at communist factories where you actually have small worker owned factories that exist. Like in the United States today, the tech company up in, I think it's Wisconsin. There are car companies that work like this, bread factories. But like it's it's maybe 100 or 200 people. They work together. They know each other. Um, they can meet together and make decisions together. And there's a sense of responsibility and accountability. When you have 25,000 people, it can be harder to instill that sense of accountability. Not impossible, but more difficult. And we're going to see China try and do that, right? And, and how they're going to try and do it. But it's going to turn more totalitarian as opposed to truly autonomous. Um, additionally, and again, so Marx was thinking smaller communes uh, and not even like autonomous factories, not these massive collectivized state-owned um, entities. Okay, so, uh, so you're going to have some people, thousands of people, farming on these farms, but also these farms will not just be producing agricultural goods. You're also going to have some of the peasants on these farms producing steel. Because Mao's attitude is, well, why do you need to do this far away in these factories? Let's have the peasants do it. And so, and again, there's a pretty big buy-in here because Mao has this sort of nationalistic version of communism which should kind of remind you almost of like Hitler's nationalism in a way although it's not genocidal but this idea that like hey we're awesome and we can do anything if we just work hard enough and so is communism supposed to be nationalistic no it's supposed to be global but Mao has this idea of China being awesome as China and better than everybody else and so their communism is going to be different and better than everybody else's and um peasants can do anything if they just are given resources and they try hard so the peasants are like, yeah, totally. Thanks for the vote of confidence. We can we can do this. Yeah. And so they build they build homemade like kilns to heat up the steel uh, or to heat up the iron ore to melt it into steel. Um, and 
they're melting down anything they can get, not just actual raw iron ore, but like steel pots and pans, or hairpins, or decorate, decorative item, items, or farm equipment. And they're dumping them into this kiln, and some of the kilns are made, like, they're running out of straw to, like, you know, to make a kiln, you need, like, mud and straw to keep it together. Um, so people are, like, cutting their hair off and putting it in there, which can work, but, like, this is the level of dedication you're seeing. Um, is this going to work? I mean, no, it's, you're going to melt this stuff down and it comes out, but it's not heated hot enough. It's not pure enough. Like these steel cooking pots are not high grade iron ore. They're, um, um, they're alloys of different types of metals, not just iron. So the, the steel that's coming out is, is brittle and it breaks. And yet Mao has set these high quotas that the peasants are supposed to try and reach. And so they're melting all this stuff down into this useless steel. And so it's a disaster. Like, you're wasting all of these resources. Um, now people don't have pots to cook in. Um, they, they're, they don't have enough farm equipment because they're melting all this stuff and they're spending all their time doing this. So what's going to happen to the food production? Yeah, this is uh, it's bad. Okay, so this is going to be referred to as the giant leap backward. Um, industrial products, as I said, are kind of terrible. It's also going to lead to a massive famine. Okay, um, 20 million people die in this famine, 20 million people. So if you recall, that's about the number that Stalin killed in his purges. But this is just one thing that Mao did. Um, it's more than were killed in the Holocaust, right? That was 11 million. So now this is not intentional. This is not an intentional destruction of his own people. This is an accidental outcome, but it is man-made in the sense that it's not a natural disaster. It's not a drought. Um, it is a misallocation of resources, and it's made worse by the fact that the government was not getting accurate information. And so had they realized what was happening, they likely would have put a stop to it because they're not trying to murder 20 million of their own people. But the peasants are being told by the leaders of the communes that they're supposed to work really hard, be really productive, and grow more crops per square foot on their land than they've ever done before to try and prove how awesome their agricultural techniques are and how great Chinese peasants are. And the peasants are trying to do that with some new technology and, and fertilizer and things. And so it's possible to an extent, but not to the extent that the Chinese government thinks it is. And part of the reason the Chinese government thinks it can grow more food on less footage, which also means you'd need fewer peasants actually farming, which means some of them can make this steel, um, is because of the reports they're getting. So we've got a situation where, you know, you don't want to be accused of being disloyal. And so if you're saying, hey, we can't grow this much crops, well, then people are going to say you're not trying hard enough. You're not a good enough, good enough patriot. Um, you are, are secretly, uh, you know, a member of the bourgeoisie and you need to be gotten rid of, right? You're just trying to sabotage communism. And so people are afraid to admit that they're not actually able to grow the food. Like they are trying to grow 400 um, times or like, four, yeah, increasing their crop yield by like 400%. And you can't do that. You can't actually pack plants that close together. So in this case, a lot of what they're growing is rice. And so rice needs um, wet territory, but it also needs obviously access to the sun. And if you're cramming these plants in so closely together, they're going to just rot in the fields because they're not going to get enough access to the actual sunlight. So, you know, what farmers are doing um, under the leadership of these like commune, these massive farm leaders is they're creating model sections of their farm where they're actually growing the rice, but then they're transplanting rice from other fields and packing it into one field. So it looks like they grew 400 times what they used to be able to grow. And they report that to the government and the government's like, awesome. Well, then that's great. We can spare even more farmers to go work on that steel project. And so now you have even fewer people actually in the fields growing the growing the crops. So you're getting less and less actually produced. And a bunch of it's rotting in the fields because you've crammed it really close together in these model fields. And yet the communes are now competing against each other, which again, not a Marxist idea, to try and outgrow each other, basically. Well, my commune pledges to grow 400 times the amount of growth. Well, who can top that? Well, my commune pledges 500 times. Well, mine does 600 times. And, like, you're getting these promises to grow this, like, ridiculously unattainable amount of food, which just incentivizes people, again, to keep misreporting. So the government thinks it's going to have a huge grain or rice surplus, 
when in reality, it's going to have massive crop shortfalls and you're going to see these famines. I mean, people are, are starving to death. Um, you're going to see corpses lying in the streets because like there, there's not enough people around with enough strength to left to even bury them. So it's, it's catastrophic. It is absolutely um, and utterly catastrophic. So, okay, this actually, as a bit of a side note, can kind of relate to the issue that we're dealing with uh, now with COVID-19 um, and how China failed to deal with the early outbreak. And that, again, has to do with the fact that the current Chinese president, Xi Jinping, has set up a very authoritarian system. He's trying to create a cult of personality. Um, and people are basically scared to report bad news. And so the doctor's reports, the early doctor's reports of like, hey, we've got this disease. It seems new. It seems contagious. Um, were silenced. And some of those doctors were fired. And that it's very likely that the information about what was actually going on in Wuhan never actually made it to the Chinese government in Beijing. Um, with Xi Jinping, so he probably didn't know about it because once it actually hit a level where it was un, you were unable to keep it quiet, they went from saying there wasn't a problem to locking the city down in, a, in, in like two days. So that's a pretty quick turnaround. So it, what that might well mean is that the higher level government officials didn't know what was happening. Now, it's their fault they didn't know what was happening because they've created this environment of fear and um, punishment for people who aren't, you know, again, patriotic enough to only report like the good news. Um, but, you know, the, the, it had the same kind of unintentional consequences. And now, of course, um, we see that China is the, the main um, Chinese government is trying to downplay its responsibility in this. Um, again, we don't want to blame China and the Chinese people. We don't want to incite um, racial hatred. But there definitely were points at which China's government should have handled this better and been able to keep it under control. And that is also true of a lot of other countries. Um, you're seeing, you know, politicians across Europe and Brazil and, and the United States where um, politicians often denied and news agencies denied that this was going to be a threat or a problem and they lost time in responding to it. So China had it for kind of different reasons for authoritarian, you know, crackdowns on, on free press and, and things like that. Um, but I don't want to just point the blame at China, but I wanted to link it here to this type of information breakdown, transmission breakdown, about people on the ground know what's happening, but there is a system in place where they're too scared to report what's actually going on, and so, um, or if they do, they get punished, and so then the people they reported to don't pass on that message, and so the people who are in charge of making big country-level decisions don't make good decisions, right? Um, okay, so, of course, you can also have leaders who just ignore the information they're getting, um, which is also possible that that's what happened in China. We're definitely, we've also seen that in other countries around the world with COVID-19, but um, it, it seems like probably it was just a breakdown, but can't know, can't know for sure, at least not, not at this moment. Okay, um, so great leap backward, okay? Um, this massive collectivization program ends in 1961, and we'll talk about what, what comes next. But before we do that, um, I want you to think, does this great leap backward, well, the yeah, the great leap forward that was actually a giant leap backward, does it prove that Marx was mistaken? No. Again, you don't have to like Marxist philosophy. You don't have to be a communist. But you you do need to be able to recognize what Marx was saying and, and what wound up actually happening and how leaders chose to pick and choose what they were going to do and twist their versions of communism. Marx is not arguing for massive collective farms. He's not arguing for stuff to be owned by the state. The peasants are supposed, or the people making the product, either farming or industrial production, are supposed to control what they make. They make the decisions in small democratic segments. And so there shouldn't be a system where food gets taken away from the peasants. The peasants would know they need the food to eat, right? They would know what was actually being produced. Um, so this does not, and also Marx was arguing for a ma this to happen in an industrialized society, which right off the bat, that's not what's happening. So this failure of Chinese communism is not an indictment of Marxist communism, something that, again, most people around the world and definitely in the United States do not understand that Marxism is not what we see happen in the Soviet Union, in China, or eventually we'll get to it in North Korea, right? Again, you don't have to be a fan of Marxism, but you should know what it actually says versus what we see play out um, in history at this national level. 
Okay, so, um, also, again, Marx would have been in favor of free speech, so it should have been easy for the peasants to say, hey, this isn't working, right, and not be punished. Um, okay, and of course, as I mentioned, the nationalistic nature of China and Chinese communism, which, again, especially in the United States during the Cold War and even today, Americans tend to think of all communists as the same, and they're not. Uh, the Chinese communists aren't going to get along with the Soviet communists. The Chinese communists think they're better. It's a nationalist philosophy. North Korean communism, kind of same deal. Uh, Vietnamese communism, which, again, the United States is going to have no conception of what it really is. Um, Vietnamese communism is a nationalist communism. It's a vehicle for a nationalist independence movement. Um, again, not what Marx was talking about. And it's why, for example, the Vietnamese um, are going to fight against the United States, which they see as capitalist invaders, just like their former um, colonizers, the Japanese and the French. But also, they're not going to want the Chinese communists messing with them either. Like, they don't want some big Chi or, um, um, communist global utopia. They want Vietnam, but for the Vietnamese. Um, and communism is seen as the way to fight the capitalists who have been invading them for the past almost 100 years. But anyway, back to China. Okay, so, um, what happens to Mao? Well, you know, this is bad. So, um, he's disgraced. He's forced to take a back seat in the Communist Party. He's not executed. He's not run out of the country. But he's no longer chairman, head of the party, head of the country. Several of his policies are reversed. Uh, for example, peasants can own their own land. And they can sell their produce at local markets. So, this is more like capitalism, right? Private little landowners, they control what they make and they can sell their produce in local markets. Um, factories are going to be created in cities again. So we're going to see an actual more traditional push for industrialization in a normal, more um, customary way. But Mao is not done. So he <clears throat> writes what's called his Little Red Book in 1964, so named because it is a little red book. And it's basically um, a compilation of pithy little sayings meant to catch on with the peasant masses. Things that are easy to remember, like you think of like just little folksy sayings like um, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush or an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Things that, you know, like kind of folk sayings like that. And the idea here is that this should be a book full of little sayings, almost a, a piece of advice for any particular situation you might find yourself in. Kind of a what would Mao do book, right? And if you're a truly a good communist Chinese patriot, you will memorize this book. And you won't have to think for yourself, because any situation you come up against, you'll have the right tool in your in your pocket for it, right? You, you'll, you'll have in your head, since you've memorized this book, the exact right quote to apply to the situation. Um, so this is, um, the reason Mao thinks he needs this book is because he feels like the moment for his true communist utopia is like slipping away, right? Because they're undoing some of his policies. Again, the peasants are now working on their own little farms and they're selling their produce. They're, they're making factories um, in, in cities. And so he feels like he's losing his moment to create his version of what a Chinese communist utopia would be. Um, and so he pushes, he writes this book, he pushes it out to try and kind of um, claw back what he wanted this to be. And um, it's put out to books. Teachers are forced to teach it. People are forced to memorize it. Um, and it's a major use of propaganda, right? Um, like we've seen other Chinese, or um, not Chinese, but other communist leaders um, use, right? So uh, basically, what vocabulary term? Um, and keep in mind, Mao is also producing propaganda films, right? Um, his portrait is still hung all over the place is a massive uh, war hero. Here you can see all the, especially a lot of children, but people like waving their little red book at him. So what, um, and he's like literally the sun here. What is he trying to create? What have we seen before? What is this like? Yep, this is a cult of personality, um, like we've seen with other leaders um, from again, fascist Hitler. So different ideal ideology, but still a cult of personality. Um, like we saw with Stalin, also a communist leader. Um, what kind of government is this setting up? This is a totalitarian government, right? You're trying to control, you don't just want people to sit down and shut up and do what you tell them to do. That'd be authoritarian. This is, Mao wants people in the streets 
talking about how much they love him. He wants to be in their heads, right? He doesn't want them to think for themselves. He wants them to idolize him and parrot back his little phrases and do what he would do in any given situation, right? Basically trying to brainwash, especially the children, which are being forced in schools to memorize these things. And then, of course, what you have is people, you know, if you're not doing a good job memorizing this, your loyalty is going to be questioned, right? So this is going to springboard us into what's called the Cultural Revolution. Um, this is where Mao encourages young people, once we've got them, you know, learning this book and whatnot, he encourages young people to learn revolution by creating revolution. This is sort of the ultimate hands-on learning experience, right? Um, this is how can you really appreciate what it means to be a communist revolutionary if you've never been a communist revolutionary. So young people should go out and they should constantly create perpetual, nonstop revolution. Uh, because otherwise communism can break down and you start to see the bourgeoisie reassert its desires or you're seeing, you know, Mao's earlier communist reforms being undone. So unlike Marx and Lenin and Stalin, um, Mao wants a constant state of revolution in his country, which, you know, is this sustainable? Can you have a country that's constantly revolting? No, like you can't, you can't have a functioning workforce, economy, stable life, ability to raise a family if you're constantly having a revolution. Revolutions are incredibly disruptive. Um, but millions of high school students and college students leave the classrooms and form what are called Red Guards, and they lead a major uprising, okay? Um, they, they are going to attack basically any form of traditional authority. So Mao is suspicious of intellectuals, they, um, like the intelligentsia. Um, people who were schooled particularly in old Chinese traditions, in Confucian thought, Buddhist thought. Um, he's the hero of the hardworking communist peasant, not these intellectual elites, right? Um, you've you've probably heard this just in, you know, pop culture, people being suspicious of elites, right? They're not like us, not like the rest of us, those academics. So they're an enemy of the people. So he, he um, attacks, he has his guards attack them, the, the Red Guards shut down schools even though the schools were supposed to be teaching the Red Book, um, destroys traditional relics like buildings, statues, art, um, and targets anybody considered disloyal. So now you have a situation where we've got a spy state, but in a not in quite the high-tech way we've been seeing, like in like Stalin, um, Stalin Soviet Union, and the satellite states like in, in East Germany, but we're seeing, um, you know, more the traditional, almost the old czarist state of like, pupils informing on teachers and vice versa um if people don't seem a hundred percent enthusiastic if you say one bad thing about mao or qualify your support for him in any way you're going to be denounced and attacked um thousands of people are executed or imprisoned and this can be you know i mean utter brutally violent like like pupils swarming their teachers and kicking them and beating them um so we used to watch a documentary about mao's you know, leadership during this, um, during his whole period of, of leadership. And there were interviews with teachers who had survived and um, still clearly suffering from PTSD from this period. Chaos threatens to destroy the country. Um, there are several rounds of these revolutions. So um, people like Mao will come out and say, okay, we went, we went too far. You, you know, you, you children, you need to kind of calm down. And um, sorry, everybody, you can, you can criticize, you can let us, you can give us some feedback here. And then once people start to feel secure that like, okay, well, you know, yeah, we think you went too far. Then he brings the revolution back and is like, go after them again, right? Um, it's shutting down factories. It's destroying farms. I mean, you're hurting the food supply. You're hurting your economy. It's, it's a disaster. So plus you also have like irreplaceable Chinese culture, tradition, and artifacts being destroyed. And there's no way to replace that, right? So even today in China, Mao is still considered... Um, a hero, a founder of communist China, and the Communist Party is still in charge of China today. But this period is not remembered fondly by the Chinese populace, because they do have an awareness of how destructive it was and how much of their own um, history. And again, China, even though it's communist, is nationalist. It has a proud history. It's got thousands of years of, of um, historical accomplishments and things to be proud of. Um, and and chunks of that were lost because of these riots and, and re revolts, right? Um, this should kind of remind you of, you know, you, you had to be careful, like uh, with Hitler Youth, of, of children informing on their parents. Um, and same with, um, you know, if, if 
with the clip of the child, you know, accidentally saying something to the Stasi officer in East Germany under the, the spy state, um, where he's too, too young to really know, but he's saying something and that that's going to get his father in trouble um, because his father had said something in his own house against the government. Right. So like this was a really just it ripped families apart. It was. Yeah, bad. OK, so um, one other thing I want to mention here before we start evaluating Mao's legacy is equality of the sexes. Um, Chinese communism, like all communism, um, values equality. Right. And that includes equality of the sexes. Um, Marx argued that, you know, divisions in society were artificial, whether it be by race, religion, um, or, or sex, that the idea that men and women couldn't do the same jobs was just a way of dividing the countries, um, dividing the people and pitting them against each other. Um, and that, you know, men and women were equal and they could do the same thing. And so again, this is going to be a major change in Chinese history. Um, but you are going to see the Chinese party under Mao and under successive rulers really push Chinese equality. Mao famously said, women hold up half the sky, right? I mean, that's how important they are. That's how indispensable they are. Um, and they deserve equal respect and a status in society. Now, while we haven't seen a Chinese leader of the country who's a, a woman, um, we, I mean, we have seen um, high ranking officials that are women. You see women serving in the military. And this is before this will happen in the United States. You know, the United States says it stands for equality, but, you know, the women's rights movement took several phases in the United States. You still don't have women serving on submarines, for example, in the United States Army. Um, Chinese um, um, women serve in the military well before they do in the United States Army. Um, the United States still hasn't had a female president either. So um, on that, they're kind of on par with China. Um, although, again, people can actually at least vote in the United States. Um, so we're going to look at how well um, true uh, gender equality is um, how far it really gets in China. And when we start talking about um, Deng Xiaoping's China and China today, but the push is there and there's this attempt to, to overturn thousands of years of history um, in China and, and make a big change in Chinese culture. Okay, so um, what I want to leave you with is an, uh, a reflection on how Mao should be remembered, because he should definitely be remembered. Um, massively, you know, important, big impact on China for better or worse. So, you know, how should we remember him? A hero, a villain, somewhere in between, something else? And I'm going to have you read a couple quotes and then allow you to kind of ruminate uh, on this question. So we have, because um, we've got a long history, you know, Mao's in power. Well, he's, he's leading a, rev, uh, a, a civil war for like 25 years. And then you've got him actually running China. Um, he's not in full power for the full time, but he's in a position of power and sometimes the head of the country for about another like 25 years um, until his death in, in 76, which is, which is when the Cultural Revolution finally ends with his death. Um, okay, so now you have some um, idea here that he is that he is a hero, a sun in the sky, considered the greatest leader in Chinese history. Freed China from its medieval backwardness, transformed it into a modern nation. Under his leadership, China was transformed. They had taken the countries, with, or sorry, um, what had taken countries in the West um, centuries only took decades in China, right? Um, they made the leap from semi-colony to a great power, and they do do that pretty quickly. Um, less quickly than Japan did. We've talked about that, but, but pretty quickly. Um, Mao liberated the Chinese people from economic exploitation and social oppression, says this author. Um, freed China from its feudal past, gave women equal status in Chinese society, opened China to the West, expanded the China, the Chinese economy. China's economy grew at an average rate of 11% to 15% per year creating an industrial infrastructure, laying the basis for economic transformation um, that took place after his death. So he laid this groundwork. Um, according to another author, um, the communist revolution, which Mao led, transformed China for the better. Mao battled corruption, streamlined bureaucracy, strengthened the economy, reduced the decentralized Soviet-style bureaucracy that was threatening to choke China, promoted artistic and educational reform, and worked towards social justice and the feminine I or feminist ideal. I mean, he does promote art, new artistic types, again, mostly glorifying the Chinese Communist Party, but, you know, he does fund arts. Um, all right. 
uh, and getting away, sorry, getting away from the traditional ways of, of doing Chinese theater and um, the old kind of focus on tradition and traditional values um, and allowing, you know, women to be on stage and things like that. Okay. Um, other authors. Um, the Great Leap Forward was a failure. Rather than a leap forward, it became a lurch sideways. By 1961, China was on the brink of economic ruin and internal collapse, and we will talk a little bit more about that next time. As a result of the loss of fertile farmland and poor management of what farmland remained, the annual harvest declined. The result was widespread famine, industrial output fell. Even Mao himself was forced to admit that his idea was a disaster and forced to step down from his post as chairman of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, another author, Mao launched the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution in 1966. This remains a titanic catastrophe in, what, in which human rights, democracy, the rule of law, and civilization were crushed. During the decade that followed, literally millions of people were sacked, imprisoned, or otherwise ostracized for their hidden bourgeois tendencies while tens of thousands were executed. People's lives were destroyed. Um, Mao encouraged students to rebel against authority and form on their political, uh, politically incorrect seniors and join the Red Guard, the ideological militia that pushed the Cultural Revolution forward. China collapsed into a state of near anarchy. Schools shut down, offices closed, transport was disrupted. It was so bad that even today, the full history is still far from known. While the Cultural Revolution officially ended in 1969, the worst abuse, because the worst abuses stopped then, the politically charged atmosphere was maintained until Mao's death in 1976. All right, last set of quotes for you to consider. The Cultural Revolution had disastrous effect on the educational system and the scientific community within China. It was, that effect was felt well into the late 80s. Those people in China who were between ages of 15 to 20 during the period of the revolution are now referred to as the lost generation, a term we've seen elsewhere in Europe, if you'll recall. Um, this is because they are the ones who lost out. Losing the chance for an education, losing the chance for a normal youth. They either weren't in school, their schools were shut down, of course. And also, since the Red Guards are going after the academics, they're going after the, the scientists. Mao's rule brought, with, brought about more deaths of his own people than any other leader in history. The total death toll is only exceeded by all the dead people of World War II. Some 20 million, and so that would be the Pacific and the European theaters. Some 20 million deaths can be attributed to Stalin. The systematic elimination of Jews and other so-called undesirable groups under Hitler was approximately 13 million, 11 to 13 million. Under Mao, over 40 million people lost their lives. Now, you might want to take into account which of these were intentional and which weren't. Under Mao, it's not necessarily that all of those were intentional. The 20 million from the famine are not intentional, but they're still dead, right? Hitler, it's intentional. Stalin, it's intentional. So um, just, to, just to have you, you know, I want you to think critically about this. And finally, one last author. Had Mao died in 1956, his achievements would have been considered immortal. Had he died in 1966, he would still have been a great man. But he died in 1976. Alas, what can one say? So 56, we've got the early communist victory, first six years of communist rule, the massive changes to culture that he's making. By 66, we've had the great leap backward, but we haven't had the cultural revolution yet. By 76, we've had the cultural revolution. Alas, what can one say? So how should Mao be remembered? He should definitely be remembered. There's no question about that. But how? And can you think of another person that we've talked about who the timing of their death affected the way that they were remembered? Okay. Um, I will leave you with those thoughts. Okay.